Hello everyone. Welcome. My name is Jack Gillespie. I'm a programs coordinator here at Peoria Riverfront Museum. I'd like to thank you all for coming here. Uh, I also want to do a quick thank you to our members and our Visionary Society members. Uh, without their support, uh, this and all the program at the museum would not be possible. Uh, and also a quick thank you to Sharon and John Ando uh, for sponsoring uh, this as well. Uh, this is our last lecture for our Emerging Artist Series. Uh, this is the last day for the exhibition too. I don't think I need to tell anyone here to go see it. Maybe pop back up there for one last look. Uh, we have two fantastic artists uh, talking here today. We have Tony Gant and Charles, sorry, Christopher Gothier. Uh, Christopher Gothier. Uh, I don't need to talk about them. I'm sure you'd much rather hear them talk about themselves than me. So please give a warm welcome to Tony. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, get situated here just a little bit. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm excited to have this opportunity to present my work uh, in conjunction to the show upstairs, the Emergent Show. Um, my my story um, as a maker. Um, I've always been compelled to make things as a as a person. Um, and I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about my, my history because the work I make today is not where I started my, my education. Um, to start the conversation or the discussion, I'd like to kind of outline broadly some terms that I'll begin to use about the type of work that I do, the site projects that I do, and the word that will be referred a few words which will be repeated are um, land art. Um, site-specific and installation. Um, there is some overlap between these terms, but for this particular conversation, um, I'm going to make a distinction um, of the, these different modes of working that I use. Um, here on the screen is my first land art piece I actually ever did. Um, this is in Spain, and this is my wife that you can see there. She's kind of giving you a sense of the scale of the project. So when I say land art, what I mean is that I'm using the material from the landscape mostly, and it's kind of embedded back into the landscape. So uh, in this particular piece, uh, I have a bunch of stones. I've cleared the land. I've laid them out. And, and here's where I'm a little bit vulgar. Um, and, and I painted them all yellow, these rocks. And, and if you look kind of closely, it, it's about a quarter of a mile long as, as the crow flies, but as you walk it, you can begin to see that the terrain goes up and down and it's quite terraced, and it's probably about a half mile walk. Um, the other type of work that I make that I will be referring to is site-specific, and what I mean by site-specific work is that <clears throat> it maintains the kind of visual aspect of the history of the thing that I'm working with. Uh, so, for example, it, it's a house, and, and even though, um, and then on the on the right side of the screen, you can see that the house has been kind of transformed. It, it, it maintains its houseness, but it also now is an art project. And this is a piece that I did um, as a collaboration with a, a artist from Abington, Illinois, just kind of south of where I live, Galesburg. And, and she currently lives in Philadelphia, but she came back, and we did this particular site-specific project together. Um, the third type of project that I engaged with is what I refer to as installation. Um, this was done in Iowa City at the, um, at the BS Gallery, which stands for, um, actually not what you think it stands for, but it, it stands for Benton Street Gallery. It's on Benton Street. And it's a student-run gallery, actually, um, master thesis gallery. Um, and as an installation, what I'm thinking about is transforming the space. I no longer want it to feel like a gallery space, but I want it to feel like a piece of art that you walk into. Um, and, and so that kind of outlines the three certain kind of modes of working that I am engaged with currently now. Now, as I alluded to before, I didn't go to school for this type of work. Um, I went to school for a certain personal, uh, historical, uh, experience that I had as a child. So, in other words, I decided I wanted to go to art school and I wanted to be like my heroes. And here's my first hero, Thomas Hart Benton. I grew up in Kansas City and 
I got to see lots of murals by Benton, and Benton, um, you know, and in this particular one was was the uh, doing all sorts of murals. This particular one's actually in uh, the capital of Missouri, um, in Missouri, and it's 360 degrees on that particular piece, this mural. Um, so growing up there, um, I got to see lots of Bentons. Um, the other person I was influenced, which I didn't see, um, is Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel. Um, but I was often going to the library in my church, and in my church there were books on churches and church architecture as well as Renaissance and Renaissance artists. And so my journey as an artist when I went to school, I thought should begin here. As a young person, I saw that, <coughs> that, that it looked like to me that form was well-crafted. That's what it meant to be an artist, that you well-crafted form, that your draftsmanship was good, and you were able to tell stories with what you did. So I, my, my work actually started more representational, um, what I might refer to as naturalistic, to some people might begin to use a certain sense of realism. Um, and this is a four-color print, um, a lithograph, uh, about two by three feet. Um, and, and once I kind of mastered this whole, this whole drawing schema, um, I, I began to realize that this naturalism was getting in the way of my expression. I wanted to say more than what I could get through by kind of copying the world. Um, so at art school, I was at Kansas City Art Institute. Um, at art school, I was also exposed to other ways of building form. Um, basically, art history gave me kind of the experience from the Renaissance um, to modernism. So I decided that I wanted to be more expressive, and here's a kind of six by six foot drawing that I was doing, which kind of incorporates a little bit more of that um, ex uh, expressionism into it, uh, away from the naturalism, it begins to kind of use certain ideas of surrealism and kind of cubism. And I was becoming quite a kind of hungry student. I wanted more and more and more. And, and so I was introduced to yet another thing, a tool that, um, is, which is referred to as collage. Um, and I kind of like the fracturedness and the kind of um, cubist kind of ideas that were going along with collage. Um, one of my professors said to me that every major 20th century art movement, collage was kind of at the foundation of that movement. Um, he continued to say that what collage did was it broke artists of their habits um, and, and, and made them kind of rethink what they did. Um, it kind of introduced a kind of sense of otherness within to, to the work itself. So I continued this collage tradition for a number of years, um, but it became more sculptural, more three-dimensional. These are kind of reliefs uh, that are so about seven foot, eight foot, by four foot, um, and they're about well, two feet deep. Um, the, the one on the right, I actually wasn't able to get out the studio door. It was a little deeper than that. Um, <laughs> but I was engaged with these. I really liked making these. And, and I, I pursued these for about 15 years. But on the way, what happened was the kind of narrative quality, the figurative quality kind of left them. It became more of kind of a formal kind of play. It was about moving this a little bit right, this up, the circle a little bit left. Um, and, and, and so I got kind of lost in these things um, in a way that made it very difficult to be satisfied with them, even though aesthetically they might have been kind of attractive. I, but so, so I was kind of at a crisis point. Um, I, I basically realized I had to get out of my studio, I had to get out of my head. And, and, and so this was one of the reasons I got out of my studio. I kept making these things and I couldn't resolve them. They felt like chess pieces or chess games and I couldn't figure out what checkmate meant anymore. And, and, and so they were just piling up on my studio floor. And then the next thing was that I was always bringing in found materials um, to build these things. And so I had piles of found materials and piles of unresolved work and I just had to leave my studio. I just didn't have any more space to. Uh, so here's the piece I kind of showed you a little bit earlier, the Benton Street um, installation. Uh, and, and, and by this time, I probably have about four or five different um, 
installation projects under my belt, so to speak. And, and, and I wanted to kind of talk a bit about that kind of crisis moment and when it happened, but I'll also show you this particular work. Um, so this particular work uh, was called the Copy of Capricorn, and basically it's the four seasons running backwards is the way I thought of it. The opening date was the 21st of December, um, and, and installations are a great place to be during the winter months, okay, not outside in the landscape like some of my other land are. Um, so, you know, so you come down the stairs on the right, and then you turn to your right, and you would see what I would refer to as summer, the kind of yellow portion of the slide, and, and then you would proceed left, and that's kind of the spring part, the kind of greeny part. Uh, you know, and here I've kind of given you a diagram kind of explaining it. So in the middle on the right, we, we see a staircase, and the pink is kind of like a pathway that directs you through it. Um, and, and so, again, you see spring in the upper left, and, and it's moving backwards, and so then it moves into winter, and then it moves into fall. And I'll, I'll show you a few slides from um, each of those kind of various pockets of the four seasons. Uh, but in the meantime, I will also begin to tell you about my crisis moment. So I've been teaching at the Chautauqua Institute of Art for a couple of summers. My first summer there, I created 21 kind of in, uh, 21 relief constructions, like the, the work that I had previously been doing. And, 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 and so 21 pieces in 21 days, I brought them home and I just threw them on top of the pile that was already growing in my studio. So the second summer that I was teaching there, I decided I didn't want to do this anymore. Um, haul all this work back home and, and, and just kind of add it to the heap. So I decided for the first time that this was going to be my project. My studio that they gave me there was going to be my project. And I decided to begin to activate all the walls, and I wanted to activate the ceiling and the floor, very much like you see in these slides. Um, here's the winter one. Um, and I began to realize that I didn't, it's, I didn't want to make art that people looked at. I wanted art that people stood in, um, that they, they, they were surrounded by it. Um, and so, I had one critic who came in and saw the, the, the show, and this is supposed to be the fall area. There, there was lots more dirty laundry on it when I originally started the project. But, um, so that was fall. Um, but back to Chautauqua and, and the work I've seen there, the critic came in and he said, oh, this is kind of like a Mondrian painting on acid. And I just, I didn't know what he really meant by it, but I, I think he meant it was kind of wacky. Um, and, and so that's, but regardless, I was hooked. I decided this is what I want to do. I want to look for more opportunities to do installations um, and, 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 and do site work. Um, so um, as I began to realize, there, there, were, there were plenty of opportunities. Now, I'm going to move back and forth. I'm not going to in a linear sequence between different projects. But um, this is the, another land art piece that I did. Um, every summer, my wife and I go to Spain. Um, and so what we're looking at is a project in Spain, which is called Concentric Circles. And, and, and you know, I, I basically laid all the rocks, built the walls, painted them. Um, I, I basically did everything that visually doesn't look integrated, but into the landscape particularly. So um, I'm going to play a video and keep talking um, a, a, as this video hopefully plays. It's not playing. It was playing a moment ago. There we go. Okay, so as this video plays, um, I'll, I'll just keep talking a bit uh, about this particular project. Um, so, um, what, 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 what you are seeing is that I'm working on abandoned farmland in Spain. Um, basically, the people who own the property are living in nearby villages or towns, but they no longer want to work the land. It's pretty harsh as, as a landscape to work. Um, it's not running, I'm sorry. It was working a moment. <laughs> yeah. Apologize. Always technical problems. All right, well, I'll just keep talking about the piece. Unfortunately, I, the video is not working so well. Uh, so, it's an abandoned farmland, and and, and, and basically, what they want to do is they want to sell the land to wealthy people. 
Um, as you can see, it's a relatively big thing. And, and again, this is what I'm beginning to realize about what I want for my work, is that it's an engulfing experience. Um, this is kind of what I began to realize that when I was looking at the uh, Thomas Hart Benton units, looking at the Michelangelo, they, they were actually making art that surrounded the viewer 360 degrees. And, and, and that's kind of what I wanted with my pieces. Um, and this is another bland art that I made. Um, this is uh, again in Spain in a different location. Uh, I haven't titled this one, it's called, uh, but it's in a place called Puliana, um, which is a town of about seven people. Uh, again, abandoned farmland. And, and what I want to do is share, you, share with you a little bit of the process of how I go about making these. Um, because people are like, well, how do you do this? And, and, and so the process uh, changes a little bit from piece to piece, but the two consistent things that I do is I walk the landscape and I make drawings from the landscape. Now, some of them are more diagramming, some of them are a little bit more uh, descriptive, uh, but I, I'm making drawings and walking the land to feel the landscape. Um, and, and, and once I begin to feel the landscape, and, and, and I keep going back and forth between drawing, I'm actually beginning to kind of try to figure out the proportions of the landscape in this particular drawing, or maybe the shapes that I'm beginning to kind of feel in the landscape. But before I commit to the landscape, I also want to make sure that I have enough materials locally um, to make my piece. And if I don't find the materials locally, then I will abandon the site. Um, so, uh, so as I commit to a site, I begin to make little gestures. I begin to play. I begin to try to think of using materials in a way I've never used them before. Um, and, and then I finally start. And you know, when I finally start, usually um, it's the wrong thing. I, I always start with the wrong place. It, it's never right. And then I have to always go back to doing more drawings. I'm always kind of going back and forth between drawing and I'm walking and working. Um, the, the, the one thing that I'd like to, this, to, to say a, 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 about this a little bit more particularly is, is that you know, time is the, probably the final factor that, that goes into figuring this out. And that is that I got deadlines. Unlike any time before when I was working in the studio, I, I didn't have deadlines. The pieces could go on forever and ever, whereas this work, I couldn't come back to it. Um, it would be a year later, and the whole thing would be quite transformed. So, so there's a sense of urgency um, that, that I get when I work on these particular pieces. Uh, a, a, another piece that I did, and this one I would call more site-specific, in that I'm trying to really kind of get it to integrate into the, the, the piece. And this was at the Grand Rapids Art Museum in Michigan. Um, and, and it's basically the snow and lice that you see in the foreground is the piece that I made. Um, the process for this one is just a little different than most of my processes. Um, and, and, and here's the Grand Rapids Art Museum. And then you can see kind of circles in the bottom right hand side of the screen. And this is a, a park that was designed by Maya Lin. Um, and I didn't have the whole park in there. But what you're seeing is an amphitheater in the summer and it becomes a skating rink in, in the winter. Um, but because I'm working with a museum and they want to know kind of what I'm up to and they want to see um, what I, I want to do, um, instead of presenting drawings, I, I went ahead and I made model, a, a model, kind of a basic model here. And, and here we see on the left, there's a big plane that's supposed to be the top of the museum and this circle's supposed to be the ice, ice skating rink. Um, and, and then we see these little two tiny trapezoids between the museum and, and the circle of the ice skating rink. And, and, and you know, I, I was asked to do this project in January. So I thought, I want to do this in snow and lights. And so these little trapezoids are kind of piles, or what I envisioned as piles of snow with lights. And, and, and then I did kind of a little study. Um, but you know, I also had plan B and plan C and plan D. You know, there's always the opportunity, there's always the situation where it doesn't snow, even though everybody tells you the lake effects in Michigan will provide you with plenty of snow. So I get there in January, it's seven degrees and there's no snow. Um, so I started with the third model um, that I had proposed. 
And, and, and basically, these kind of scraps that we're looking at along the lines here, um, we're mimicking kind of architectural details that were in the museum. Um, and, 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 and so, oops, sorry. And, 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 and so, what, what, what you see also are these two mounds of snow. So eventually, as I was working on the project, it began to snow, and it continued to snow, and it just didn't stop snowing the whole time I was working on the project. So I decided to incorporate the, the original, or the more ideal plan of the snow and lights in with this third structure that I had, um, that I had started with. So those are kind of the way these projects come about. Um, <coughs> This is yet another land art piece that I, I do, or have done, rather. And, and what we're looking at here, in what looks like a field, is a prairie. It's a restored prairie. You know? It's the third oldest restored prairie in the United States. Um, it's part of the Knox College Biological Field Station. And the brushy-looking piles that we see um, are what I have done to the prairie. I basically this is called wind, and I basically divided the prairie in half with this brushy pile. Um, now, the brushy pile, what it is in particular, are invasive species that are trying to take over the prairie. These are very fragile habitats, and, and they have to be stewarded. Um, you have to go out, and you have to maintain them and take care of them. And so my idea was to take these black locusts that I'm I'm finding marching onto the prairie and, and, and putting them kind of um, in a, a, a blind or a line situation um, as an art project. Uh, and, and as I was building these things, um, I kept on having them blow over when the wind would come down the prairie. So I finally came upon a structure which was more of a, a, a tetrahedral structure than a classical structure. Um, which kept these things from blowing over. Um, and, and historically, when I started looking back at this, I began to realize that there were other people who used the similar building style, um, often referred to as a reindeer fence. And, and, and when you kind of look at them, they do kind of look like deer crossing the prairie. Um, here it, it, it is kind of what the blind was blocking. This is, and you can see these kind of colored sticks in the distance. So those are the young saplings of the black locust that I have been cutting and poisoning, and then I paint the, the, the sapling stumps um, so that you see them. But um, I'm trying to move the trees back from encroaching on the prairie, and then in the foreground you can see the little bundles, and these are the bundles that I put in the structures um, of, of the thing crossing the prairie. Um, so, and, and, and for me, this was an opportunity, unlike a lot of my other projects, to be a little bit what I might refer to as ecosensitive, that I'm actually trying to care for a place, um, participate in making um, it a place that reflects what we wanted to reflect, that um, it's a restored prairie. We want to maintain our restored prairies because in Illinois, there's less than 1% of actual natural prairies still left. Um, and so that was my opportunity to practice a certain ecosensitivity. Now, part of maintaining a healthy prairie is burning it. So these structures that were sitting out there a couple of years later were, were burnt. So um, that was kind of the end of that project. And, and all my projects are ephemeral. They don't last forever. I'm not interested in them lasting forever. Um, a, another project that I participated in or did um, was in Wisconsin. Um, and this one um, was an invitation from a friend, a colleague at the college. Um, and he owns a farm up in Wisconsin along the Mississippi, and most of it's in the valley, but there's some hills that he has attached to his farm. And he said up on one ridge of his farm, he had these effigy mounds that the Native Americans had put in. They, they had put, and up on this hill that I went up to witness, there was um, a bear and a bird that, that I could see up there, very sculpted out of the earth. Um, and, and, and down below where this particular project, or under these effigy mounds, um, was an old tobacco barn, which was sitting abandoned. So I went in to start thinking about what 
And I knew I wanted to do a mound piece, and so I went into the barn and started repairing the barn. There were some kind of structural elements um, that were kind of um, not right, so I, I, I kind of shoring up the, the barn so it wouldn't fall on my head while I was working on it. Um, I began to kind of, and, and if you look at the illustration below, there's kind of these circles, and those are the support posts. And I began to kind of find that I kept weaving in and out of the support post, and, and I realized that um, I, I wanted to make a more of a serpent-type map, and, 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 and out of earth. And, the, and, and if you look at the barn there, you begin to see that on the left-hand side of the barn, that the earth is actually sliding into the barn. Um, and so this becomes the earth that I use. Um, I dug the barn out to begin to build these mounds through um, this barn. And in the process of, of building this mound, I also found things in the barn, and then I just put it, I went ahead and put them up in the lofts. Um, and, and here on the left, upper left hand, you can begin to see an old wagon that was actually in the barn as well that I, I lofted. Um, th this last piece hopefully will play. Yeah, will play. What does it say? Next play. There we go. So here, here's. Okay, so this was a project that I've already talked about a little bit. Um, this is the project at um, Goyleana. Um, and during the closing reception, th there was. Um, a producer and filmmaker, um, and I was talking to her, and she said, oh, I know somebody who has a drone. He can document the work for you. And, and I said, oh, that would be great. But when I got the, the, the documentation, I actually got a finished piece. She had edited it and, and found somebody to do the score for it. And, 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 and so I have this wonderful piece that um, I could never do based on the way I've always been documenting it from the earth. Right? And so now I have some documentation from the sky. So um, what I'd like to kind of say as this video plays a little bit longer is that you know, I, for the past 15 years, I've done about 40 of these large scale pieces. They're all ephemeral. Um, they're, they're in some ways not about the enduring of art, but they're about a moment in time and a moment in place and a kind of celebration of, of this moment in this place. Um, I'm not an environmentalist, uh, I'm not a biologist, I'm just an amateur, I'm somebody who's interested in biology, I'm interested in culture, um, and, and, and I also am a teacher and I also profess, and I always suggest that you should spend some time, you know, looking to things that are bigger than yourself. Um, I remember meeting somebody from Imoquan, the kind of uh, restored marshlands not too far west of here. Um, and the director said that for him, the artist um, was somebody that actually took the language of science and made it interesting and communicable to um, the people who were to the general public. Um, so he basically said, you know, artists are these important things. But I would also say, you know, just always be engaged in something bigger than yourself. Uh, that is pretty much all I have to say for today. So, um, do, should I do questions later or? No. Yeah? No. No? Do questions then? Okay. Yes, um, I, I, I generally have a little bit of help, um, but very rarely do I have help. I'm pretty much the only person out there. This particular project, well, since I, I've done so many of them already by now, and this was this, this past summer, um, it took six weeks. Um, I get up, and, and this again is in Spain, I get up at, uh, I'd be on site by seven in the morning, um, just as the sun's coming up, and, and, and then by two o'clock, it was too hot to work, and it was you know, getting up to about 100 degrees, and so it was too hot to work more. So but that was basically what I would do, is work from seven to two for the past six weeks. Yeah. So did you paint in place, or did you paint the rocks in the middle of the place? Good question. Um, I, I actually paint them once I've already put them in place. 
it makes it a lot easier. Because um, sometimes I change my mind. Um, and, and if I were to paint the things first, then I would probably want to put them somewhere else. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I kind of have to create a system for myself that will allow me to, you know, like I said, I've got a timeline and I've got to come to a resolution. Yes? What's the process you have to go through to get access to that land? Well, like I said, this is abandoned farmland. And, and so it doesn't belong that, to anybody? It, it belongs to people, but they, they never bother me. I, I, I go and I ask as many people permission as possible, but you know nobody really knows exactly what belongs to whom, um, except for when it comes time to sell it. Then the people who own the land show up to sell it. Um, but you know they don't bother me. Yes, Tony, do you revisit these sites? Yeah, I, I do. You know, I, it, since I go back to the same place in Spain, I, I do get to see those those projects. And do you document that then? No, I haven't changed. actually. No, the, 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 there's something about you know what they're you know they're basically going back into nature. And they're disappearing. Um, but you, as you ask that question, I actually do have a friend right now in Spain documenting this last piece <laughs> daily. Uh, so so you know, uh, I haven't done it, but I'm in the process of doing it. Right so good question. Yeah. Anybody else? documentation. I used to have a website, but I let that last. I'm not really deep into technology, but I have to use it. Um, and I need to get my site up, and, and that is basically the way people experience it. Either you have to be there, or you have to experience it through this other process. Yeah, there's a question back there. Yeah, so uh, most of these pictures are from really far away. Um, is there more, like, how much effort do you spend on the details that you have to be standing right there to um, it's pretty important to me. As I said, I have people come to the closing of them. I should have brought some more detailed things, but um, I don't know. I thought maybe the last video we could tell you, show you some of the, the detail. Um, but yeah, um, you know, I, I, I keep wanting to do it very broadly and very quickly. Can't. There's, there's something about me wanting to make sure it's just kind of almost as bright as I can get it, given the time it's here to have. So, yeah, so I work always to the deadline. I, I mean, I'm finishing just before I have a, a closing reception. <laughs> you know, I'm like half awake when everybody shows up. <laughs> uh, yes? Tony, would you like to do something permanent? Like, like Spiral Jetty, obviously one of the most renown of the land forms that are permanent, but would you like to do something like that? Have you ever been approached to do something that's more permanent? Um, no, I've never been approached to do something more permanent than I can think of. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um, it's a huge commitment. Um, and and I, I'm not, like, at least up to this point, I've always just thought of it as a celebration of that moment. I guess I, some people say I'm much more thin about the whole process of the <laughs> year. You know, it's, it's now and, and, and that's it. It sounds a little bit to me like the way it gets me is like on the one hand it's like play, but on the other hand it's like precision. Yeah, so. I mean that's what all, you know, people when they see it they always go, oh that looks so fun. I mean, I do want it to look fun. I want it to look like a celebration. But it's a lot of hard work to go into a celebration, right? I mean, if you want to do a celebration in the right way, 
It's, it's a lot of time and energy. Thank you.